Hey guys, welcome. Hey, Coach here. Hey, we've got the longer days and we're on the cusp of summer. Days are longer. Some places it's a lot warmer. And we start turning our attention to things like swimming. Well, this particular week's episode is gonna talk about landscaping in and around swimming pools, both existing and new. Are you with me? We're gonna learn a few things here today. Stick around. Hey, first realization, a little check with reality here. I am very aware that not everybody has swimming pools. And I am also very aware that there are different kinds of swimming pools. One particular one we're gonna share towards the end of this video, so stick around because they are very unique and growing in popularity. But we're all very familiar with the, the cement pond out back. Uncle Jay, can I go swimming in the cement pond? Oh, I reckon so, Jethro. But this ain't like the swimming hole back home. You can't go in there without no clothes on. I can't? No, sir. Okay, Uncle Jack. The ones that are made of rebar, gunite, plaster, cement, everything that goes along with it. Recirculating filters. We're also familiar with the big ones that just drop down into a very large sand bed. And then we plumb them and backfill around them for an in-ground pool. And I'm also very aware of the above ground. The above ground ones that have a support frame and the vinyl liner to hold the water in and filters, etc. Now, with that being said, those above ground pools are not necessarily applicable here, but, but you can landscape in and around those. You can think it out as far as your uh, navigation to and from any pool, but particularly an above ground one, getting to the family room door, getting to the master bedroom door, getting to wherever foot traffic is going to be. We're gonna talk about that type of navigation as well. Now, if you haven't yet, but some of you probably have, when you contract to have a pool installed, if you haven't done it, wait till you get through that getting pulled through a knothole backwards feeling when you have a reasonable backyard before construction and then you have an absolute atom bomb gone off in there when the pool is all finished. Not the pool itself. The pool itself is brand new. It's pristine. You can't wait to jump in it. But you may have to trot across busted up lawn, irrigation things sticking up. And by the time you have that 50, 60, 70, $80,000 pool dropped in your backyard. Now you have to turn your attention to reconstruction. Maybe irrigation needs to be redone, replumbed, and relined so that it fits the new layout. Drainage lines may have to be reinstalled or installed in the first place. Hooked up to channel drains if you do have those at the end of the patio area. And lighting, electrical, etc. Yeah. If there was one thing that I'd stress on this channel and on the podcast, and that is plan. Plan. Failing to plan is planning to fail. And when you have a big project, especially five-digit investment in a big swimming pool, I want you to think ahead as the construction evolves, as you even sign that contract, you negotiate with that pool company salesperson, and you make sure that you are looked after. You're looked after in the form of, all right, pool company built by the Smiths, you're going into my backyard, you're gonna dig the hell out of it. How much destruction is gonna be done? How much are you responsible for and how much am I responsible for? I don't want to, or I will, to save a few dollars, I will take care of the broken irrigation, the drainage that has to be repaired, or, I'm gonna pay a few extra thousand dollars and you're gonna take care of it. But make sure it is written down, it is in writing, and it's codified so that you know every expectation. You know, many pool contractors, not all of them, but there are a few out there. Their main goal, their main purpose is to dig a hole in your yard, drop a fiberglass pool shell in there, plumb it up for you and call it good. Or 
you know, wire basket it up with all the rebar and all the PVC plumbing. Put water in it, finish it off, call it good. Many of them do not pay attention to the aftermath or the landscape fallout that comes from that, unless that is part of your contract. So, as the construction, shall we say, phases evolve, it's going to be crucial for you to stay on top and be ready to go to replumb your yard, both drainage and irrigation. Relight your yard as far as cable and stuff. Support those irrigation pipes and drainage pipes so slope and everything is taken care of. Irrigation is supported because when they start backfilling, there's going to be a whole lot of weight put on those irrigation pipes. Once you're able to get that irrigation replumbed, make sure before the sides of that pool is backfilled and compacted in that your irrigation pipes are tested and watertight, 1000% watertight, and they're supported. They can be supported off of the, the swimming pool plumbing. They can be staked in place and tied to strong rebar stakes or whatever you might find, but don't just have them sitting in there like that and then tons of backfill go on top of them. And all of a sudden, that pipe that seemed sturdy is now crushed and crushed at a joint. And then when you have that explosion under underground and you don't know about it and your sprinklers aren't coming on or they're coming out in a dribble, you're going to wonder, WTF, do I have a broken line underground? And now you have a gunite pool. You have at least a three or four foot apron around it of cement. And now you know down there there's going to be problems. Now, here's another solution for you. You don't have to put it all in at that phase. You could just sleeve it. Make sure the sleeve connections are good and that they're daylighted at the opposite and starting ends so that when you do it, when you do put it, everything back together again, at least you're 99.9% .9 assured that those sleeves are going to be okay. You know, and then you can run the pipe underneath. For you guys up in the northern latitudes, like where I'm at right now, you know, you'll be running poly pipe and stuff through. For those of you in the zone 7, 8, 9, 10, and beyond, you're probably going to be doing PVC. But it is critical, and I can't stress this enough. Use heavy gauge pipe. Use sleeves and get ready. Get ready when that construction phase calls on you. There's a couple of construction techniques when pools are being built. You know, you can have the standard kidney-shaped pool or whatever, the vanishing edge pool, whatever it might be. But there are generally, uh, especially, yeah, it could be in flat, it can be in sloped areas, it could be anything, but pool contractors will design uh, bulkhead walls on the back side of the pool. For when, uh, oh, like sheer descent waterfalls are going to be used. And then behind that bulkhead wall might be a planting bed or a, a diving area or a lighted torch, tiki torch, natural gas, um, fire fountains. There's a myriad of creativity that can go on. But if it's going to be planted later on, it's good for you to get out there and sleeve that wall before it is poured. That way, super simple. Your pipe just goes through the sleeve. <laughs> Hell to pay though if you have to dig down or you have to roto hammer a hole through your brand new bulkhead wall. Not necessary if you're on top of it ahead of time. So in addition to uh, your pool construction and the phases that go on there, you're also going to have that uh, three or four foot decking, that cement decking that goes around your pool, unless you've opted and bought much more patio and much more pouring. Hopefully you stay consistent with the style that is there and maybe get creative for the rest of the patio between the pool and the house. Make sure you have good, flat, durable surfaces that are easy to walk on barefoot. Make sure those surfaces have just a little bit of rough to them so there's no slip and slide, but not too rough that if somebody slips, it's not going to take nine layers of hide off of you. So something easy to walk on barefoot. The other thing is drainage. Drainage around 
and about a pool area and that patio and decking that go with it is paramount for a couple of reasons. Number one, evacuate water because your pool is going to be just ever so slightly raised compared to the rest of the landscape. And water is generally going to flow away from a pool and not to a pool. Therefore, channel drains and other things might have been installed during cement laying and that water that comes off of your patio and not to your house will hit those narrow channel drains and be evacuated, hopefully, to a safe discharge place. Then your job, your job as a homeowner, is either to hire a landscape pro like myself or do it yourself and get that water off the property and out of the area so that you don't have standing water somewhere, whether it be chlorinated water from splashing or whether it be rainwater or, God forbid, a rain event that overflows the pool. We don't want to deal with anything like that. But if it does happen, you have the drainage in place and ready to go that will handle a rain event such as something like this. Don't forget lighting cable if you're going to do some lighting. You know, either have sleeved the patio or you've already pre-strung it so that it's ready to go. Don't forget electrical if you need electrical out at a pool house. Don't forget gas if you're going to have an outdoor kitchen out underneath a new gazebo or whatever. All of this stuff is pre-plumbed. When you start doing gas and stuff, most of the time you can incorporate that in the permit pulling for the pool itself because they'll generally want to pull it for a pool heater or something. Okay, let's get on to the fun stuff. Let's get on to the greenscape that goes in and around a pool. What I have always suggested to clients over the years is that most pool greenscape, all the plant material and stuff, think small. Think dwarf, semi-dwarf, low growing. What you're trying to avoid is to have a big eventual tree canopy that is going to be around the pool. Number one, it's not going to heat the water up very well. Number two, leaf litter, leaf debris, bugs and other things reside in trees and fall from trees and we don't want that. And most importantly, you don't want a selection of trees that are going to be massive, especially root wise. We don't want your cement decking in your patio getting lifted by trees that have found a little source of water somewhere and now they are underneath that patio from the lawn or whatever and are finding that then they start growing bigger and bigger and bigger and pretty soon you have that cracking shift. You don't want to threaten the bulkhead of that pool itself. Now most of the time those bulkheads are pretty thick. They're 10, 12, even 14 inches thick. So chances are it's never going to punch through, but it can uh, get a lot of pressure from outside pressure. And a short story for you is I had a client that called us to re-landscape after they had to take large redwood trees out of a raised bed behind the pool. They planted five or seven of them back there because they look good, they grow fast. Oh, they're evergreen, so they're really clean around the pool. And about 10 or 12 years later, they suddenly found their bulkhead of that raised bed starting to get pushed this way with cracks down below. They had to get a tree company and get those things out of there pretty darn fast. Then grind the stump, dig down, remove all the massive roots that were down there. And then they called me to come in and make it pretty again. Well, we certainly did, but by gosh, we didn't go down that road again. We had... A lot more tropical stuff that went in. A little bit of an arbor overhead for some viney color and that kind of stuff that was going to stay pretty darn clean and pretty darn small. Something to consider. Some of your uh, tree, shrub, perennial type of selections are going to be based on hygiene. Now with some of the pool filtration out there, some of the jetted type of pools, Boy, these things can clean themselves and you'd hardly have to ever lift a finger. But there's going to be some care, whether you delegate to your pool guy or you do it yourself. Either way, you can make it easier on your pool system, the pool guy or yourself, by making sure you have plant material and plant selections that stay relatively clean. They don't have a lot of mess. Now, one tree comes to mind, a tree or a shrub, depending on how you're grown. 
And I had this at one of my houses with a big backyard pool. And that's the crepe myrtle. Now don't get me wrong, I love crepe myrtle trees in the right setting. Had quite a few of them around Weed Patch Ranch. But planted close to a pool between leaf drop in the fall, between flower drop late spring, summer, late summer, depending on the variety you have, and then bark drop, seed drop, and the occasional aphid infestation, which can really make a mess in and around a patio. You really have a high maintenance issue, and you want to try to avoid that. So maybe crepe myrtles, if you really want the color, they're placed in the backdrop and quite a ways away from the pat or the pool or in the pool patio. Those flowers, they can stain, they can stain cement pretty easy if they're left to sit on there. So consider that. Now, I got a few plant selections here that I'd like to share with you. And you can either screenshot it or whatever, whatever you want to do, just some ideas, some that I've used in and around pools and some of the landscapes I've done. Take a look at the list. Now I'm going to go through them kind of fast just to save time. So when it comes to trees, most of the time, most of the time I had the trees really set back and away from the pool itself. I did have some trees a little closer in and palms, the smaller palms like sago, like Mediterranean fan, like uh, dwarf Canary Island date palm. Although that does have a pokey, you want to be careful. It's not something that you're going to want to put right next to where bathing suit people are going to be. And if they fall into that thing, it does have a pokey on the, on the frond itself. And the windmill palm. Just some of the selections. Some that are lower in stature and don't get really big. Try to stay away from the palms that become telephone poles after a few years. Like the fan palm, Washingtonia. Um, queen palms, majesty palms, unless you do them in containers. Those things eventually, they look super good about years three to five. And then after that, you basically have this big trunk and you have a neck wrenching canopy that's up there that you don't know what's up in there. And it's very really hard, almost a professional level to go up and clean the fronds off and stuff. So make sure your palms are really a, a smaller variety. Now, some of the other plants and trees. You may want to think about windscreen if you have prevailing winds. So maybe arborvitae, maybe various kinds of cypress. And then you get off into maybe a fruitless olive like the Swan Hill variety. One of the, the trees that I did use around quite a bit, and that was a dwarf evergreen magnolia. The variety was Little Gem. And Little Gem, well, it came out back in the, the late 90s or so. I don't know the exact hybridization release, but it basically is 20 feet or less, and it does have a flower, but the leaves are big and easy to clean up. The flowers do not stain, and for quite a few years, you can clip them when they're done, and you can actually dispose of them before they fall on the ground and make a mess. So consider that tree as well. Other variety of evergreens are like dwarf spruce, like the dwarf Alberta spruce, uh, some of the, the little fat Albert uh, Colorado blue spruces, they can be relatively clean and the needle drop pretty much stays underneath it. And so consider some of those selections. Now, as far as shrubbery, New Zealand flax, diatonella, boxwood, dwarf holly, perennials such as uh, salvia, speedwell, achillea, dusty miller, manzanita, verbena, soft tip yucca, gazania, mosses, all of these mixed together and used together would be a good start to something that's going to give you a lot of color, not a lot of bee population, which I'm going to talk about in a minute, and relatively low plant maintenance. Speaking of bees, for those of you who live in uh, drier climates and stuff, especially hot, dry climates where water becomes kind of a scarcity in the summer, <laughs> that sounds like most of the western U.S., Bees are going to be attracted to pool water, not only to water that is splashed out for uh, a water source for them, but also the pool themselves. You may want to consider not just for safety purposes, but also protect the hygiene of the water is to have either a manual or an automatic cover. There's nothing worse than going out there. You want to do an evening swim and you got nothing but 
drowning or near drowning bees that are floating around in the in the water and the skimmer went off hours ago so they're there going doing their little buzz circles not only does it hurt bee populations for gosh sakes but it's not just honeybees it can be yellow jackets wasps and hornets now something that's on the horizon that not a lot of people know about but i wanted to share it with you and that is not the chemicalized cement pond that we're all so familiar with whether above ground or in ground. There's a new one on the market now. It's called recreational ponds. And basically, they are koi ponds, fish ponds, but ponds in general that are a little deeper than average and have beautiful waterfalls, beautiful natural filtration. And they're put in in the fashion of boulders, river cobble, stair-stepped levels, gravel bottoms, and they are very natural in appearance. And you have access points of big boulders and that kind of stuff, and you can swim in them just like if you went to a lake in the forest and you were able to swim. One company, Aquascape Incorporated, back in uh, Illinois, does some of these, as do other people. But the recreational pond serves two purposes. Gives you a place to cool off. Gives you some naturalized environment like fish, and frogs and wildlife that are attracted to it. Nice ambiance, 24 hours a day with waterfalls, jumping rocks, the recreational pond is coming on and serving two purposes now, not just your koi pond in the backyard, but a place where you can go and relax and enjoy and cool off. You might wanna check them out if you get a chance, recreational ponds. Hey, and if you'd like to take a few minutes, jump on over to the website, youryardcoach.com. Help old coach here out just a little bit, maybe check out the book, maybe the digital course, thanks to my two purchases just recently, and make sure that you uh, pick up that 15-step DIY checklist. Very good for the DIY landscaper. That's what I have for you this week. Don't leave just yet because I'd love for you to check out this week's plan of the week, and also check out the other educational videos that I have, not only this week, but next week, and going back a couple of years. A lot of educational value there. I really appreciate you guys sticking around to this point. Consider subscribing and following along, and don't forget to drop a comment and give me a like. I'd really appreciate it. Hey, summer is here. Time for those pools to go in, and if so, whether new or existing, consider some of those steps and some of those cautionary notes that I have left in this video for you. You got any questions directly to me, youryardcoach at gmail.com is always available. You guys take care as always to your landscape success. Bye for now.